I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. My experience happened in late August or early September at dusk. I guess I should start by saying my father lived with us during his bone cancer and strangely relates to him in a way I'd never expect. So this experience happened several months after my father passed away, but I'll share how all this comes into play later after dissecting it over and over in my mind that day. On that particular day, I remember entering a turkey trail and looking up at the sky and saying a prayer to my dad, to God, for a sign. Forgetting all about that we hiked the trail and made it to a creek that feeds into a lake called Shenango. My wife was photographing mushrooms, flowers, and nature. I noticed our beagle Harley acting odd as she was whining, shaking, and wanted picked up. I guess it was my thought she had been stung with a bee or stepped on a thorn. I picked her up, and no sooner had I picked her up, we heard a vocalization. Jenny and I stood motionless in shock, listening. We communicated with our eyes only, as I think we just couldn't speak at that moment. The noise was, as I think back, something of prehistoric nature. Primate-like, but also louder than anything I've ever been so close to. We actually watched a puddle in front of us ripple, and a vibration inside our bodies. I'm not sure how or why, but the vocalization became more of a warning-type nature. We watched trees about 75 feet in front of us shake and thud. Jenny and I made a silent agreement to just leave. As we turned to leave, still carrying my dog, it made a loud, lung-filled, oh, woof, oh, woof, type of sound, almost like it was prompting us to leave. We headed back up the trail, and the entire time we felt it almost on both sides of us, and it felt like more than one. I briefly turned and saw only shape and mass, no detail. Jenny and I made it back to our truck, and still the entire way home didn't speak. When we got home, we started researching animal sounds. Nothing matched, so we entered Bigfoot vocalizations. The very first entry was a recording called The Ohio Howl. As we listened, we realized it was exactly what we heard, and after researching the recording, found out it was recorded in Wellsville, Ohio, only 40 miles from where we had our experience. For weeks, I would dissect this encounter over and over in my mind, and it hit me one day on my way to work. I was driving my truck, and I retraced that day of my encounter, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember my dad saying, if you lose something... Go back to the beginning. So the beginning for me was entering the trail that day. I remembered saying a prayer or thought to my dad for a sign. This is where it gets very strange for me, because one of the last memories for me of my dad was weeks before his death. He asked me to take him outside on the deck to listen to the birds and look at the trees, and then he said he was done and wanted me to take him back in the house. I then asked him if he wanted to watch a movie so he chose a movie from a stack of movies my sister from Maryland gave him. He chose a movie, and I put it in the DVD player. I remember watching him watch the movie, thinking it could be the last time watching him smile and laugh as his cancer was getting worse. It hit me that the very last movie my dad watched was Harry and the Hendersons, a Bigfoot movie. If my dad wanted to get my attention in any way, it would have to be big. I realize now this experience is in no way a coincidence. The experience then takes on a new layer for me and only gets weirder at this point. This is when my life changed more even after this huge experience. Jenny and I took our friend Roger back to the exact location to show him where we had this encounter. We showed him and started hiking out. Getting closer to our vehicles, we heard what sounded like a dog bark, a man mumbling, and a whistle. Jenny got the dogs, as we had both on this day. Nothing came out of the wood line, so Roger and I went to the ravine edge to see what made the noise. We watched something very large, covered in hair, rise up and bolt in the opposite direction away from us. So for me, this thing became very physical, but it also had this strange connection to my father who had passed away. This whole experience has changed my life in ways I can't explain and I'm on what I call a journey for answers, which has taken me in some really amazing places. 
My research has taken on a life of its own, and the things Jenny and I have found is, and I say this because I see other people's research, very different. We have recordings, prints, and tree branches twisted out of the trees. Shelters, nest-like, and things that really make you stop and think. Is this thing something more? I've had two experiences that were obviously interactions with a bipedal primate, and several that are less substantial, but nonetheless intriguing. Most of my experiences happened when I was a child, and I have since had a huge desire to see this primate again through adult eyes, possibly as final validation that my childhood memory can be trusted. Before I go into detail about my experiences, I need to provide some context with a description of my background. I grew up in two locations, Pineville, Louisiana, which is at the Red River in central Louisiana, and Copenhagen, New York. Moved there when I was 10 years old. Copenhagen is a little town in upstate New York that's situated at the base of the Tug Hill Plateau at the edge of the Adirondack Mountains. As a child, I spent all my time outdoors hunting, trapping, fishing, and camping. I had free reign to do so as often as I wanted. I loved, and still do love, being outdoors and getting away to the Sierra Nevada mountains as often as I can. I spent many a night alone in the woods with nothing but a wool blanket and my dog. The point is that I'm an avid outdoorsman, and as such, have always had a great deal of interest in biology and other related sciences, so I'm very familiar with animals of the forest, their behaviors, and their sounds. As an adult, I've spent time serving in the military and have been working in high-tech government R&D for close to two decades. My forte has been in image acquisition and analysis. I consider myself to be very pragmatic and analytical when it comes to answering questions and solving problems. This is partly why I can't let go of my previous encounters. They've left me with unanswered questions. On to the encounters. The very first What the F moment, circa fall 1981. I'm in the first grade and I'm dragged out of bed before dawn on an impromptu hunting trip with my dad and uncle. We drive from Pineville, Louisiana, north to somewhere near southern Oklahoma. We get to the designated location around dawn and we park the truck on a dirt road in a forest in the middle of nowhere. I'm cold and tired, so I ask if I can stay in the truck while my dad and uncle hunt. My dad's okay with that because I'm probably more of a liability at my age anyway. I immediately fall asleep on the bench seat of the truck. As the sun came up, the cab of the truck warmed up and I slowly began to wake. As I sat up, I looked out in front of the truck down the road. As immediately as I did so, about what I can guesstimate was 50 or so yards down the road, a huge shaggy man with reddish hair covering his whole body took one step across the dirt road from my right to my left. My first thoughts were, Wow, he's really tall, and what's wrong with him? My feelings or emotions were of sudden extreme anxiety, however. It almost felt like a purely physical response, as opposed to one more cognitively connected. I still find this fascinating today, and have a theory as to why I, like so many others, have such an overwhelming response to seeing one of these primates. My dad and my uncle immediately came running back to the truck from the same general location on the right side of the road. They were terrified. They jumped in the truck, violently shoving me between them, and slammed the truck into reverse, speeding back up the road. Assuming that they had obviously seen what I had, I asked my dad, what was that? His immediate and very angry response was, shut the F up and don't worry about it. Apparently, he had the same emotional response that I did. I never spoke of the encounter again. One thing I'd like to point out is that my dad is six foot nine and weighs about 350 pounds. My uncle is six foot seven with a similar build. They're very large, capable farm boys that aren't easily scared. My second what the F moment, circa summer 1982. I'm in Pineville, Louisiana at a family friend's house with my sister and parents. There are a bunch of us kids running around while the adults have a barbecue slash party. They live on a large spread not far from our house. There's pine forest on three sides and not very many neighbors. It's evening, after dark, maybe as late as 9 p.m. 
There are pixie sticks on the counter in the kitchen, so I ask for one. My dad lets me eat one as long as I stand outside on the back stoop and eat it, so I don't make a mess in the house. This sounds like a plan to me. As I step out the back door, I turn on the floodlight while I take a step down onto the stoop. The floodlight illuminates a burn barrel at the edge of the property, about 60 to 70 feet away. It's right on the edge of the range of the light, so it's hard to make out. I don't notice it at first because I'm tearing open my pixie stick. As I look up at the burn barrel, I notice a set of red eyes staring back at me from the darkness. They're set wide apart and very easily discernible. They are at the height of the top of the barrel, maybe four feet off the ground. How tall is a 55-gallon drum? I'm nervous about the glowing eyes, so I open the back door and yell into the house, telling my dad about it. He offhandedly responds that it's either a puma or bobcat, and as long as I stay on the stoop, I'm fine. I close the door and focus on the eyes, which are looking around somewhat, but still intent on watching me. I get that same extremely anxious feeling as I notice the pair of eyes float up well beyond the height of the barrel. I can't say how high the eyes were, but they were much higher than my perception of how tall an average adult would be. I ran inside, scared to death. Recalling this memory, the floating of the eyes was actually the creature standing up. Third, what the F moment, early fall, 1982. Evening temperatures were just beginning to drop. I believe I had just started the third grade when my next encounter happened. It was a Friday or Saturday night, and I was up late watching a documentary on Healy's Comet. I'd say it was closing in on 11 p.m. My father was asleep in his chair as I sat on the couch eating popcorn. When the show was over, I decided to go outside and get a bead on where Haley's Comet was going to show up in the next few years. I frequently went outside at night because free night crawlers are cheaper than the ones at the bait and tackle store. I lived at a log-style house on Donahue Ferry Road in Pineville, Louisiana at the time, and the large acre-plus lot was surrounded by pine forest. There was a small pond and a marsh at the rear of the property line that I used to fish in and explore. As I was looking up at the sky, I gradually made my way down the slope in the backyard towards the edge of the forest near the pond. I got three quarters of the way to the pond and started to walk back up the lazy slope to the house when I heard this god-awful scream come from one of the wooded edges to my right as I started my walk. Initially, I thought Screech Owl, but the scream was so overwhelmingly loud and voluminous that it had to be coming from something huge. I instantly panicked and started sprinting toward the house, watching the tree line on my right. I was sure I was going to see some sort of monster come barreling out to grab me. As I got to about the halfway point, I was even with the creature as it belted out another scream. I looked toward the noise and could make out a silhouette of an arm, shoulder, and head of something really tall standing by a tree and shaking a large branch. I bolted in through the back door and immediately went to my dad, who was stirring in his chair. I told him what happened, and he kind of looked at me for a second, and I knew he had heard the scream also. Nonetheless, he told me to quit screwing around and go to bed, that it was just my imagination. Scared and angry, I did so. However, despite telling me to do so, I heard him load the rifle as he went outside and sat on the front porch near my window. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you enjoyed today's video, here's one you don't want to miss. Also, if you have a story you'd like to share on this channel, email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com. I hope to hear from you soon.